This video will show you how to go from a silicon mold to a slip cast or press mold piece of clay. But more importantly, it'll explain why you might want to try and do that. This video is the summary of a longer blog post that I'll link below. And so if there are any questions, check there first for more details. This is a project I've been working on for about a year and I have put into use on various things that I've done in the last year. I've been meaning to make a video, um, haven't quite got around to it until now, but here we go. So why would you want to use a silicon mold? And these are silicon baking molds. This is why they're um, so useful is because there are thousands of options for baking molds. Don't get many for pottery, but that doesn't matter for us. Why would you want to use a baking mold in clay? And the answer is really simple. Slip casting and using plaster molds for press molding is a fantastic technique with potentially a very steep learning curve to get to the point where it's actually useful. I love slip casting. I think it's great for certain applications. I hate working with plaster and I really hate trying to make a mold when I'm using a physical solid object and trying to pour plaster over it. And the reason is the properties that make plaster so fantastic as a way of making a really detailed mold are the, exactly the properties that work against you when casting a solid object. It gets into all of the details and it sets really hard and it's very brittle. So it keeps its shape, doesn't deform and gets into all of the cracks. Now that is a problem if the object you've put into it is also very solid because you can't get the two apart. They bind together and it's very difficult to separate them. When you are learning slip casting, particularly if you're following a guide on the internet, it will generally show you how to make a mold, a plaster mold of a found object, like a bottle or something like that. And you'll set the bottle in clay and you'll pour plaster over half of it, flip the plaster over, pour plaster on the other side. So you've got a two part mold with the bottle taking half of the bottle at a time. Now the problem is, in my experience, you generally get the bottle stuck in one half of the mold and it does not want to come out because any overhang, any anywhere that the plaster can grip that will hold the piece in place, it's gonna do it, you're not gonna get it back. And if both pieces are brittle, you'll break one of them getting it out. Now that's not true of flexible things, which is why silicon is fantastic. My main use for slip casting and this has saved me a huge amount of time over doing this with a slab and a cutter, is I make these little fridge magnets to include as gift when sending out my tools. It's got a little self-adhesive magnet on the back and it's slip cast in marbled slip. So I use black and white slip or multicolored slip and you get an interesting pattern, makes a really nice fridge magnet. I can make them in seconds. I can make, you know, if I was doing nothing else, I'd be able to make hundreds a day but whenever I've got slip out, I make a batch of these, so I've got loads spare. Now I make them by casting them in these, and I make those by pouring the plaster into this silicon mold that I made myself. Now I made this mold by pouring silicon over the top of a 3D printed shape that was in this shape. This is a great way to, it's called a mother mold, it's a great way to reproduce plaster molds. You have <clears throat> something made of silicon, or a flexible material that's durable, that can cast repeatedly into plaster because the plaster will wear out over time. But this way I can just keep producing new ones. In order to make this, I needed a 3D printer. I needed to be able to come up with a 3D design of the shape that I wanted, which I then printed. There's a learning curve to, to printing, especially uh, resin 3D printing. There's a learning curve to that. Then you have to use the silicon. Silicon's expensive. I don't know, five, 10 pounds worth of silicon just in this. But then you have something that functions really well as a way of mass producing these, which function really well as a way of mass producing these. If you, as a beginner, had an idea for something that you wanted to make like this, the steps required to get to here are expensive and time consuming. And you know, there's a lot to get to that point. You can skip over a lot of the steps that the difficult steps at the start, either by pouring plaster onto a solid object and then trying not to break either of them getting them out, or <coughs> learning to make your own silicon molds. 
you can skip over all of that by finding something made of silicon that you like and sign off. And the fantastic news is that there are a near infinite number of silicon baking molds that work with varying degrees of success, but by and large will work really well for this purpose. This is my favorite. This is a Lego character mold. <clears throat> it's designed for chocolate. You can see the inside, you put, they're quite small, which is why I think it's a chocolate mold, rather than kind of baking a cake. Some of the ones that I've got are a bit bigger. You would typically use the inside. Now we're not going to do that. We are going to use the reverse. This one has, unfortunately, one of the problems that you will see on silicon molds in that it's got strengthening struts between them. Obviously, it doesn't show up on the inside, so this is beneficial for in intended use. From our perspective, this is slightly problematic because these will appear in the plaster mold if you put plaster over the back. You can cut them off if you want. Um, I left them in for this, and that means I have to neaten up the uh, pieces that come out of it because the slip will get into it slightly. If you can avoid getting molds with those, I would, but um, not the end of the world. But what you do is, hopefully I've got other video I'll overlay while I'm showing you this. But what I do is first I fill these inside bits with plaster. The reason for that is that this mold's fairly strong, but you will find others are very flexible. And if you were to pour plaster over the top of this, it would just flatten or float because there'll be air trapped underneath it. Where if these are full of plaster, they will do neither of those things. They can't collapse, they won't float. Start, you fill these with plaster, let that set. Then you just turn the whole thing out onto a slab of clay, thinly rolled sacrificial clay. If you've got reclaim or something you don't particularly care about, it's good to work with that because you don't want to get plaster contamination in clay that you would then want to use, but that's up to you. You, or you can do it any number of ways, but this is the way that I find easiest, is just roll out a very thin sheet of clay, um, because you can press this down into it, keep that stuck down, which is important, because um, you don't want it kind of floating up or twisting. Having the ability to squash it into a slab of clay is quite useful. And then I use, these are all linked on the blog. So this is a standard um, size for a, uh, silicon mold you'll find a lot of them are those approximate dimensions which works really well because this is an ikea um, i think this is an ikea 365 but it's one of their storage boxes you can cut the bottom off and it fits perfectly over the mold so now what you do is you press this down into your clay and then just fold the edges up to seal it around the edge and you now have a perfectly sealed smooth box own into which to pour your plaster. Now there are a few tricks to pouring plaster and a few tricks to mixing plaster. The blog goes into more detail. Essentially what I do is I spray it with window cleaner because that helps break the surface tension. I pour the plaster into a low point, let it rise up over the form so it doesn't trap any air bubbles, it pushes the air out as it goes. I get a paintbrush that I saturate in plaster and then I brush over the surface once it's all covered. What this does is it dislodges air bubbles which then want to float so if you can knock an air bubble off the surface and keep agitating the plaster the air bubble won't then reattach to the thing and it gives you a better uh, an air bubble free surface just fill the thing up with plaster let it set then you have the slightly challenging task of getting this out but the point with it being silicon the only reason it's difficult to get it out is that you filled this with plaster if you can get these little bits of plaster out, then the mold just folds away from the edge and it's really easy to get out. Once it's full of plaster, it's a bit wedged in there. But this mold has flexibility. It can stretch and it can change shape, which makes it much easier to get it out. Well, it makes it possible to get it out. If this was rigid, you would struggle a lot more to get it out of the plaster or it might be impossible but because silicon has flexibility um, it gives you a perfect impression of that shape and then you can pull this mold out so you can make multiple copies of something like that 
then you have a plaster mold into which you can either press clay or pour slip and then you can have these lovely little duplicates now <clears throat> these i've been using as test tiles i don't have many left in the studio because i sent a bunch out to another potter but here's one where the glaze ran a lot more than i expected and well i say expected i knew it was going to run which is why it's on a sacrificial little coaster um but i wasn't expecting it to run quite that much anyway it's permanently stuck there now but that's fine glaze testing is a fantastic use for these because they're very quick to make you can make them interesting and then you know your test tiles after you finish as long as they're not stuck to the little bit of clay are really interesting they're nice things i stick neodymium magnets to the back of them and have them as like decently chunky fridge magnets um because the little magnet that i use for that wouldn't be strong enough i mean it probably would hold it up but it wouldn't hold much paper where you put a hefty magnet on they make really nice fridge magnets did the same with these cool dinosaur molds <clears throat> this goes to show how long i've been preparing this post <laughs> or <laughs> how long i've been intending to make this video but i got um, a set of halloween ones that i was going to make the video before halloween so i could tell you um, how to do this and you can make your own halloween ones you can get a set of tombstone ice molds these make really great test tiles and then they're nice ornaments i mean nice halloween ornaments but i was using them as props for my halloween photography you can also get a mold of little skulls and i made these to attach into my clay pieces i'll put some pictures on screen and then made some of these as fridge magnets as well i really like this mold now with these you can make you get the inside bits you get a little hemisphere mold that you can press clay over and then you get the inverse mold the main mold where it's cast from the back of this oh and i should say obviously this one releases really easily this just pops straight out of the clay because there's no complexity to it at all uh, and no overhangs no kind of vertical surfaces so this is a really nice one to start with if you want a beginner project like an absolute beginner project if you get yourself a hemispherical mold you get something where you can cast little bowls which tiny little kind of like pinch of salt bowls which are nice things in their own right and you get these which you can press mold little slabs over they're a nice fun useful thing to do a good way to get started on it so that's more traditional slip casting because if you were casting in something like this you'd pour in and pour out and then i can't for the life of me remember what these are called but the more intricate baking molds so this is a little tumbler again slip cast the way you would typically slip cast where it's poured in poured out um i got a set of oh, the name's gonna really bug me obviously i know what they are um anyway i'm sure someone will tell me in the comments these molds there's a variety of this sort of thing but this is fantastic just the way the glaze runs so again if you wanted a project to start making little things slip casting and you wanted to make your own slip casting mold you can find molds like this it's a larger mold obviously that means mixing up more plaster but these are a really fun project i got my so i think i used an old yogurt pot to put that into cut one of the molds off and then that's my mold but this is just i cut round a bit of it i imagine it came as a set of like six like the others do and i cut one of them off pressed it into the clay pressed a yogurt pot over the top with the bottom cut off cast the plaster like this that's why it's that shape and then what you get is just an individual mold that you can cast this in now this one has supports around the base which you wouldn't ideally have this is what you get if you cast the inside of the mold which gives you a nicer shape something to play with you can either cut them off with a scalpel on the silicon or you can you could cut the clay to neaten it up or just leave it which is what i've done but um yeah really fun shape again taking so long over this having not got the video in time for halloween i then got some christmas molds which i started trying to use and then i wasn't convinced but i also didn't manage to record the video in time but again you can make little 
don't know if you can see that in the video, um, little Christmas shapes that you could press mold into or slip cast into. You could have these as magnets, as hanging ornaments or make press mold and then attach them to the side of a mug. Really easy to make the mold. You find the design you like, you can use it. This one's super flexible, which is why I never got around to using it. But um, these would have been very fun to cast their little kind of Christmassy houses and you could cast them super thin and have them as hanging tree ornaments or you could leave the base hollow and cut the windows out and have them as tea light light up things. I didn't actually get around to either this year but I will hopefully next year. It's very flexible so I'm going to have to be a bit cunning about how I go about that, I'm not quite sure. Maybe if you built the plaster up in layers so you don't have like once you've got a shape inside it, then it will be rigid and the problem solved. It's how do you build up the inside shape without it bowing outwards? Um, so maybe I'll pour a little bit of plaster in it and then let that set and then build it up because it doesn't actually matter exactly how you do the inside so long as it supports it. Anyway, there is potential copyright issue with selling the things that you produce from this. Now, obviously, when you buy a mold, like a Lego mold, if this is a licensed one, this comes with the understanding that it's okay for you to produce duplicates of a copyrighted design for your own use. Because that's what a mold does. Obviously, you're not infringing on copyright by doing that, because otherwise the mold would automatically mean that you're infringing on copyright. The problem will come if you sell them. So I'm not selling any of these. I started this as a project to have an easy way for beginners to get into it because, because of you know all the things that I mentioned, this is a really easy way for beginners to get into Slipcast. So obviously, legally, you're allowed to produce things for your own use. Uh, you won't be allowed to sell them. If you're selling something with the copyright of, you know, someone designed this, they won't have given you permission to sell things in this design, likely. I mean, it's possible you're buying a mold with the copyright to produce that object for sale, but I think for the most part, you won't be legally allowed to. Whether or not the designer of this particular dinosaur cares that you're selling them is an entirely different matter. Whether or not you feel you're gonna be caught, again, that's all up to you. But legally, you can't just start churning out Lego characters and attaching them to your things and thinking you're fine because you paid £10 for a mould. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. So use them for your own purposes. Use them as test tiles. Uh, it doesn't give you kind of grounds to sell them. How I'm going to apply this concept to my own production going forward with non-copyrighted designs is, say I came up with something similar to the Lego character, but my own design. So I had the copyright to it. Again, this is, requires the ability to 3D model and 3D print, but assuming you have those and you had your own design for a character or could commission someone else to do this for you, and there are people who will do that, um, what I would do is I would essentially 3D print a tray that could be filled with silicon. This is two different projects, but hopefully this will make sense as a concept. But what I did is that this is 3D printed in resin, and it is a tray with a design at the bottom, but it's sealed, it's watertight, you can fill this up. What that means is rather than having to make a complicated container for your silicon when you cast it, this does the containing and it minimizes the waste because it's all on a flat plane. So you basically just fill this up with silicon. Um, when I've done it, I've cast them thicker, but you wouldn't have to with this. You could cast it that thick. So what it will do is it will fill up the shape and then you'll have a, a solid uh, a sheet across as well. And then you could make your mold exactly the right size to go in something like this, at which point you would have essentially something like this, but it would be solid, but solid silicon. Another tip, if you were going to get into this, is when you fill up the insides, you could do that in more silicon rather than plaster. That would give you the flexibility when you came to remove it. 
Now, I haven't recommended that because that involves buying another material that's more expensive. But if you're serious about doing it, that's a pretty good way to do it. Um, but if you cast it yourself in a tray like this, these will be solid silicon, so you wouldn't have to go through that step and it'd be much easier to remove. At which point you can then very quickly just mass produce trays of well, uh, plaster like this. Um, and then you can cast your stuff, but it would be your own design and you could use it any way you want it. So that's kind of the next step. But from a beginner point of view, find yourself a mold. I do really like the dinosaurs and the Lego characters are my favorite, but obviously it comes with the caveat that it's got these supports on, which aren't ideal. I would recommend getting the dinosaurs to make fridge magnets or getting the Lego men and getting the IKEA 365 storage container that goes perfectly over the dinosaurs, which is why the dinosaurs in particular, but um, you'll find a lot of them will be this standard size and will fit perfectly in there. And then you're just using plaster and clay, which you'll have in the studio anyway. It minimizes the amount of materials you need. It means that these are all things that you can buy as pre-existing things and it skips those first difficult stages and gets you to the point where you're learning about how to mix, pour, work with the plaster and then from there you can do your chosen final process with it. So whether you're press molding or slip casting, it gives you the ability to get to that step with minimal complexity where my experience of slip casting was that I gave it a go in the first year of pottery and hated it so much that I didn't pick it back up for another few years because making the molds and well in fact the whole process is a huge learning curve and it's really difficult anyone who thinks that slip casting is cheating and is easy hasn't tried it there are just so many things you have to learn in order to do it well and this process lets you skip to the learning part without just buying a pre-made existing mold. You can take something interesting and make it your own, but without having to go right from the very start. That's the, the scope of this project. Hopefully that's given you some ideas to either get started in an easy way or take this further and do something new with it. This concept can be applied to more than I've applied it to here, and you could do a lot more with it than I have done here, but this was a starting point and hopefully this will get more people involved and get you started. For me this was like the slip casting equivalent of my first five glazes where the idea was to minimize the complexity and get you started in a way that still meant you were learning the process but that you needed the fewest materials, wasted the least amount of those materials while you were learning and still taught you the fundamentals of the overall so that you could go from casting this to the more complicated, difficult casting a found object um, in multiple pieces of plaster to make a, a complex mold. You can go to that from this. What you'll have learned here will still be useful. Hopefully that all made sense. As I say, there's a blog post which is a bit more comprehensive and a bit less rambly. If you've got any questions, stick them in the comments. Hopefully I can answer them. But yeah, check out the blog post if you want to find out more and let me know how you get on if you give it a go and which molds you pick. Because honestly, the hardest part of this project is that there are so many molds and that I can't realistically buy and test them all. And I have really wanted a lot of molds that I have not bought and might still buy quite a few of them even though I don't need them. So good luck with it. Hope you enjoy it as much as I have and I hope this video is useful.